there, Awana friends. How are you tonight? I hope everybody's doing well. Listen, I wanted to talk with you tonight about what these two things have in common. A cup and walls. Oh, well, maybe it's really a cup bearer and walls. Can you think of anyone in the Bible who was both a cup bearer and a builder of walls? And what would that have, what would those two things have in common, do you think? Well, I know that some of you know who it is, right? Because we've gone over it before. I know you know. That's right, Nehemiah. Well, I was thinking about Nehemiah this week, and I realized, you know, his two really big jobs in his life, the two things God really allowed him to be successful at, have a lot in common. Being the cupbearer for a king, and then being the guy who got the walls built back up around Jerusalem, right? Those two jobs are in some way about the same thing. I know that may sound funny. Let's take a look, if you don't believe me, let's take a look. Oh, you do have your Bibles, right? Hang on, I'll wait right here. Great. Okay, turn to Nehemiah chapter one, and let's take a look at what it says there. I think you've all heard about Nehemiah, but let's just remind ourselves about who he was. So, chapter one says, these are the words of Nehemiah, son of Halkaliah. I, Nehemiah, was in the capital, city of Susa, in the month of Kislev, in the 20th year of Artaxerxes' reign. Okay, so Artaxerxes had been king for 20 years, and he was in the capital city of Susa. Um, so he gives us when and where and everything all about it. Now, verse 2. While I was in Susa, one of my brothers named Hanina and some other men came from Judah. I asked them about the Jews who'd escaped captivity and still lived in Judah. I also asked them about the city of Jerusalem. Okay, so his brother came to visit from Jerusalem and Nehemiah was curious and asked him how things were going for the Jews who, who had escaped captivity, the people who hadn't been taken away into Babylon. How are they doing? They answered, Nehemiah, the Jews who've escaped captivity and are in the land of Judah are in much trouble. They're having many problems and are full of shame because the wall of Jerusalem is broken down and its gates have been burned with fire. When I heard this about the people of Jerusalem and about the wall, I sat down and cried. I was very sad. I fasted and prayed to the God of heaven for several days. Then I prayed this prayer. Lord of heaven, you are the great and powerful God. You are the God who keeps his agreement of love with the people who love you and obey your commands. And if we go ahead and read the rest of the book of Nehemiah, we find out that this man who did such super exciting things for God started out by praying. He was asking God to remember his people. Nehemiah confesses that they've not lived as God would want them to live, and he asks God to help him as he goes to the king. Now, let's think about this a little bit. Oh wait, one more super important thing you need to know. Take a look in chapter one, look all the way down at verse 11. There's a sentence that stands all by itself. What does it say? Now I was the cup bearer to the king. Okay, so what's a cup bearer? A cup bearer means he was this really important man that hung around with the king all the time. Whenever the king was gonna have anything to eat or anything to drink, Nehemiah was right close by to test it first. Now it wasn't like just a taste testing. It wasn't like he was making sure it tasted good. He was making sure it was safe for the king. Nehemiah was guarding and protecting the king. You see, the king had enemies. He was afraid of being poisoned and the cupbearer was his protection. The cupbearer would drink his drink before the king did. He might taste his food before the king did, and then everybody watched. And if the cupbearer didn't get sick, if the cupbearer didn't die, then the food was all right for the king. Wow, makes you wonder though how dangerous that job was, right? You can see that job might be something you might not want to take on if your king has a lot of enemies. Well, because of the nature of the job, the, the high risk that Nehemiah was running, cupbearers were very highly paid. They were among the closest people to the king, they were around them a lot. They were the most trusted people in the entire palace because the king literally put his life in their hands. So you see, when Nehemiah says, I was the cupbearer to the king, we know he was a very trustworthy man, but Nehemiah was in Persia. 
but he wasn't Persian. He was an Israelite. Remember in the verses we read, he talks about how his brother came from Jerusalem. That's where Nehemiah had come from as well. All the people from Judah had been captured and removed, and just a very few people had escaped captivity to still live in Judah and in the city of Jerusalem. That once great city of Jerusalem, where the temple had been, where King David had ruled, it was destroyed. Its buildings were in the ruins. Its walls were torn down so that it was open to its enemies to come in. And as his brother had told him, its gates had been burned with fire. There was no way to protect that city from enemies. So Nehemiah began to pray. That's what we read, right, in chapter 1. He wanted to do something. So let's look in chapter 2 and see what happens next. In the month of Nisan, in the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, so he lets a little time go by, but it's still the 20th year of King Artaxerxes, so he hasn't let too much time go by. Some wine was brought to the king. I took the wine and gave it to the king. I had never before been sad when I was with him, but now I was sad. And the king asked me, are you sick? Why do you look so sad? I think your heart is full of sadness. I was very afraid. But even though I was afraid, I said to the king, may the king live forever. I am sad because the city where my ancestors are buried lies in ruins and the gates of the city have been destroyed by fire. Then the king said to me, what do you want me to do? Before I answered, I prayed to the God of heaven and I answered the king, if it would please the king and if I've been good to you, please send me to Jerusalem, the city in Judah where my ancestors are buried. I want to go there and rebuild that city. Now, and then we see that Nehemiah asks him not just to allow him to go. Nehemiah has the nerve, the guts, to ask the king for a letter of safe passage so that he can get there safely and for lumber to rebuild. Isn't that amazing? And guess what? The king does it. Nehemiah knew the Lord was leading him back to Israel. In fact, Nehemiah became one of the new leaders of Israel. He spent the next few years living there in the ruins of Jerusalem, working hard to rebuild this city and constantly under the threat of attack from enemies. He gave up a position of power next to the king. He gave up living in comfort in a big fancy place. He gave up living in luxury to go live in ruins among the dust and the dirt and the broken stones, to work really hard physically, strenuously in the hot, hot weather and in the cold wind and whatever might come out there in the weather. Hard, to work hard. When God called Nehemiah went and he didn't care how uncomfortable it was or how hard it was, why do you think? Why was it important to have those gates and walls put back up? Why did Nehemiah care that the city of Jerusalem had its walls and gates put back. Well, because that's how you protected a city in those days. It kept it safe from enemies. The enemies couldn't get in if the walls were strong and the gates were thick. So Nehemiah, having been the cupbearer of the king, he knew how important it was to protect the important things in life, to protect important people and important things and the treasures like the temple that had been in Jerusalem. The walls would stand between the city of Jerusalem and its enemies, just like Nehemiah, as the cupbearer cup, cup bearer to the king, had stood between the king and his enemies. Nehemiah, that man who held the king's cup, he understood how important it was to guard the precious and true things. I wonder. You know, in the Bible it tells us, above all, guard your heart for everything you do flows from it, in Proverbs 4. In fact, that proverb goes on to say that we should guard what we watch, what we do, what we say, all as part of guarding our hearts. Our hearts and our minds are affected by what we see and do and hear. It's like God wants us to put up a wall of protection between us and the things of the world that would try to affect us. I guess it's a little bit like this pitcher of water, right? When we let a little bit of something in, does it really matter? I mean, if Nehemiah the cupbearer had allowed somebody to put, you know, just a little bit of poison in the water for the king, would it really have made that big a difference? Would it really have done that much damage to the king? Just a little bit? If we allow just a little lie or a little anger to settle in our hearts, 
Does it really make that big a difference in our hearts and in our minds in the end? I think you can see that it does, doesn't it? Just like when I put a little bit of food coloring in this perfectly clear water, it doesn't take long before it's affected the whole pitcher full of water. No, Nehemiah knew you don't want just a few enemies to come into the city of Jerusalem. You want a strong wall of protection. You don't want just a little poison in the king's wine. No, you want it to be pure and unaffected by, by something that would do ill to the king. And you know what? We don't want just a little bit of sin to find a foothold in our lives, do we? No. Now, we're not kings. We don't need cupbearers. But we do need to watch what we allow into our hearts and minds. Instead of being so careful about poison, we need to be careful about the little sins that tempt us to, to give them a foothold in our lives, to let them become part of our lives. We can't allow lying or anger or hatred or um, disobedience any of those sins that we know go against what God wants us to be and do, we can't allow those into our hearts and minds to stay. Instead, we have to root it out, tell Jesus we're sorry when we do those things, and turn to Him and turn to God to help us live a life that's pleasing to Him. The Bible tells us in Philippians 4, 8, Brothers and sisters, continue to think about that which is good and worthy of praise, Think about what is true and honorable and right and pure and beautiful and respected. In other words, put good thoughts of Jesus into our hearts and minds to guard against that which would do us harm. It's quite a challenge, isn't it? Are you ready to be a Nehemiah and guard what God has given you? Guard what is most precious? to keep the enemy out. Let's thank God for all he's given us. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for the example of Nehemiah in the Bible. We can see that he was brave and obedient and willing to give up his own comfort to do and say and go and be whatever you wanted him to go and do and be and say. He was, he was obedient, Lord, and willing. Help us to be obedient and willing in the same way. Father God, help us to guard our hearts and our minds, our thoughts, our deeds, our actions in you, just as carefully as Nehemiah guarded the cup for the king, just as carefully as he rebuilt those walls to protect the city of Jerusalem. In your name, Jesus, we pray. Amen. All right. Are you guys ready for a little game of cup bearing perhaps i think mr shelton's on his way stay tuned and i'll see you next week hi guys it's me again your wonderful game director and i understand you've been learning about nehemiah the cup bearer to the king well what if you didn't have a cup well, we're going to have a little fun this week with one bowl on this end and one bowl on this end. And we can use either a small measuring cup, a large spoon, or a ladle, whichever you may have handy. And what you're going to want to do is try and empty this bowl into that bowl as quickly as you can. I'm going to use the measuring cup and you might want to put these a little further apart than what I've got them but just for demonstration I've got them on either end of my patio table here all right and you want to do it outside because I got a sneaking suspicion that there's going to be some water other places than in the bowls so are you ready here we go That's been probably about a minute. You guys get the idea. So you videotape your family doing this and upload it to hashtag 
Chapel City Kids, because I'm dying to see your videos. See you next week.